Well, um, today I'm not going to be talking directly about mental health, but sort of. Um, our topic, if you saw it in the program, is really entitled, How Pure Are You? And, and it's not on mental health, but a lot of times psychologists deal with these kind of issues. And uh, my husband went to get my adapter because I am from the U.S., and so I can't plug my things into U.K. things. <laughs> so bear with me as I open this. I had closed it because we don't have much um, juice going on here. I should have been better prepared. I'm usually not like this young people. Young, uh, you're not young people. I mean young adults. And so um, bear with me as I try to get this back up. What are, what are the age groups here, if you don't mind telling me? I didn't know. Pastor Ramden told me I'd be talking to young people, but y'all are about a, basically adults, right? What is, what is the age group here? 13? 3-0. Zero. Zero. Okay, but it ranges. I met some young women ladies who were 19. Okay, so like 17, 19 to like 30. All right. Okay, well, prayerfully this will be a blessing to you all. How pure are you? Um, purity is something that we don't think about at times, but it is something to think about. And especially what I'm going to be hitting on is, boy, I'm just so unprepared this morning, you all. Please excuse me. <laughs> We're going to be hitting on um, sexual purity. Have you all heard a lot of talks on that? Really? Okay, I was thinking this would be a rehearsal, so this is going to be good. And I'm also going to be asking you all's participation in a little bit, so be prepared for that. How pure are you? Look at this water. Look at this water. Which one would you prefer to drink? This one. Why? Because what? It looks clean and pure, and this one doesn't look too exciting right here, does it? How many of us think about that in terms of how we present our bodies to God? We, we want to drink pure water. We want to eat pure food. food. We want to have that, but when we think about what God wants to have, tell me, put your hand up if you think about it. Yeah, God wants a pure me too. Very few of us. We take better care of our bodies sometimes with water, our cars, our clothes, we make sure we get washed, we make sure we wash our clothes, we make sure we put the right kind of petrol, that's what they call it here, right? Into our cars, you wouldn't put water in your cars, right? You wanna make sure everything is pure. But yet we are just anyhow when it comes to sexual purity. And I'm not just talking down at you. At some point in my life, that wasn't a concern for me either. But I wanna talk about that and do some challenging for you today and see if we can um, get a better perspective on that. This is a definition of pure. Can you see that? Can you see it on the screen? Read it with me. Free from extraneous elements of any kind. That's what pure means. Any time of outside elements, that water was pure because it didn't have any outside elements to make it brown, right? So anything that's pure is free from any external or extraneous elements of any kind. And many of us sitting here don't have those types of bodies. And I don't want to put a guilt trip on you. We're going to talk about that God can forgive. But I want to make it really, really crystal clear, the need for sexual purity. And we lust after all kinds of things. Women's bodies, men's bodies, food, whatever the case may be. Lust is craving sexually, in this talk today, what God has forbidden. And some of us can lust and no one knows. Do you know that? Because it happens where? In our minds. And we can be lusting and no one knows about it. Today I'm just going to hit on a few topics and my husband's going to come in too and hit on a few things um, that we sometimes hear talked about in the church, but sometimes we don't. And I have a burden because I go from place to place and I talk to young people that's not my major work, but young people sometimes come up to me to talk, and it's amazing what they're doing that no one knows about. This is one that I'm heard, sure you've heard a lot about. What does that say up there? Pornography. Do you know that that's a growing problem in our church? How many of you know that? 
It is, even among pastors. I just heard the other day of a pastor who preaches powerfully and the wife complained to someone that he comes home after he preaches, turns on the computer and looks at pornography. This is one of these sexual sins that we can engage in that no one knows about. And it's a problem in our churches, in our Adventist churches. And what makes it things that you can do secretly actually grow. Because there's something about secrecy that just makes things fester and grow. It's like a wound that's hidden. If you don't deal with that wound and it's hidden, it could actually get worse and worse and worse. And pornography is a growing problem. We think it's just with men, but it's not. Let me look at just some statistics. Nearly half of young people actively seek out porn weekly or more often. That's a lot, isn't it? Almost half of young people do that. I will be honest, these statistics were taken in the UK, um, US, but I am almost sure it's not much different here in the UK. Another statistic, more than one quarter, specifically 27% of young adults ages 25 to 30, your age group, first viewed pornography before puberty. First looked at it before the age of puberty. 13, 14, 12 for some. That's quite a bit. 66% of teens and young adults have received a sexually explicit image and 41% have sent one. Y'all heard of sexting? Yes? Oh, okay, y'all are kind of quiet. Am I, am I just, yeah, sexting, becoming more and more prominent and we're hearing more and more people being caught, even those in the, in the political arena, arena. And this one really was something, even though it doesn't exactly hit your age group, some of you may fall, more than half of Christian youth pastors have had at least one teen come to them for help in dealing with porn in the last 12 months. And this, was take, this study was done in 2016. That's a lot. More than half of Christian youth pastors have had at least one teenager come to them and say, I have a problem with pornography. And it's not just men, as I, as I stated before. I remember going to a church one time. I could give you stories upon stories because this is so hidden. I went, I went to a church one time. We were having a dinner. We were talking, and this man was just fervent about the scriptures. He knew the 2300 days. He knew all the things, and I was so impressed. His wife pulled me aside and says, Dr. Parks, you know, my husband's talking about all this stuff. He has a great, deep problem with pornography. We can hide pornography amongst behind many, many things, and some people are helpless and hopeless. I've gotten calls from people wanting help with pornography. Sometimes I can help them, sometimes I can't. That's one of those things that just clutch you and it's just hard to let go of its claws. And I'm sure there are some people in here who can relate to what I'm saying. But there is hope. God can deliver you. 40% of internet porn traffic is with women. That really blew my mind. Because usually when we think about pornography, we, th pornography, we think of men. But 41% of the porn traffic on the internet is actually carried on by women. More and more women are looking at these things. A study of 29,000 college students, 18% of them of women, of women stated cyber sex was a weekly activity. Y'all heard of cyber sex? Yeah, cyber sex over the internet. You know, you can say things, you can show pictures and all of that, thank you. Um, so. It's, it's a growing thing, um, and it's becoming more and more popular. I spoke in an elementary school. The young people coming to me telling me they, they look at pornography. I had a family member who started pornography in the Caribbean by going to a friend's house. He gave the, her, him a pornography magazine, and it just went crazy from there. He, did, he started doing peep shows. He would... Um, uh, do the peep show, then he would run and read his Bible and spirit of prophecy and spend time in the mountains praying and pleading, oh Lord, please deliver me. And then he would go back and do the peep show and then run back to the mountains with the Bible. It was an ever continuing cycle. And that's what cycles of addictions are, especially among Christians. We think that by praying and by, uh, by, by going out and evangelizing and witnessing that we can get past these behaviors. And that's good, but it's not enough. It's not enough. So pornography is one of those areas where we're lusting and that's why Jesus says, thou shalt not, uh, when you commit adultery in your heart, by just looking at a woman, that's committing adultery. And in these days, days, days we could say looking at a man. 
This is a growing problem among young people. Did you all know that? Probably scared to say yes, right? You don't want to be incriminated. <laughs> I went to a church one time and I did another program and the youth AYS leader came to me and says, can you please come back to our church because 90% of our young people masturbate here. And it's for Christians, it's even more common because we're told we shouldn't have sex before marriage, but yet we're aroused, so we don't know what to do, so we end up masturbating. And masturbation has ruined many lives because if you ever get married and you masturbate, it will definitely mess with your intimacy life. I've heard the stories. Because we are not supposed to experience that pleasure on our own. It's supposed to be done within the context of a married relationship. But the image, oh, I'm about to give away my answer, which I want you all to discuss. But yes, we're masturbating more and more and more. And what keeps pornography going, as you know, is they look at the images and they masturbate. Am I talking too straight here? Okay. It's a problem. And I've seen it as a problem with people who you see get up here preaching and speaking the truth, and they go back and they masturbate. Because they don't want to have sex after marriage. They, know how to, they don't know how to deal with their sexual arousal and it just grows and grows and grows. And sometimes, sadly, women who are sexually abused sometimes end up having that problem as well. I spoke to some young ladies who are very Christian in their mindset. They want the Lord in their heart, but they say to me, I'm struggling with masturbation, help me. I don't know what to do. Some of them I've been able to help, I'm honest, and others I, I haven't been successful. But there's hope. And then there's this issue of petting. Some of us think that I'm going to be a little personal with you, with you here. I thought that because I didn't have sex, I was okay. But in my relationships, I was engaging petting. And I believe this affect, it's, affect, it's affected my marriages. I had two. My first husband died, and this is my second husband here. I wish that I had never engaged in petting because it affected my intimacy with my, with my, with my husbands. I'm just being open and honest with you here. And if you're engaging in it, I want you to really pray for the Lord to give you some help over it. Let me get some audience participation. Why do you think petting could be a problem? Anybody? Petting. Why do you, you know what petting is, right? Ooh, okay. That's why you're looking at me like, thank you. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> wow, I guess y'all might call it something differently here in the UK. Deep. I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> that is funny. Y'all looking at me like, what is she talking about? <laughs> petting is doing... <laughs> Be honest with me the next time I say a word. Please just tell me. I don't know what you're talking about. Petting is fondling, touching body parts, hugging, um, kissing, doing everything, but actually having the, part, the private parts come together. Penetration. Well, you all are adults. Everything up to penetration. And you feel proud because you're told in school and by your parents on church, don't have sex before marriage. Okay, we can do everything else. We can tongue kiss. We can touch each other's private parts, we can um, caress, and that's just fine, no problem. Do you see how that might be a problem? Anybody? Do you understand what petting is now? <laughs> Anybody can tell me why you think that might be problematic, or do you think it's a problem? Okay, why do you think it would be a problem? Why do you think it could cause problems in my marriage? It's not causing it now, by the way, but it was. <laughs> but why do you think it could? Oh, come on, you all. Anybody, let's, let's, be, let's be open here. We're just being open and honest. Well, I'll just tell you. For, oh, good. Go ahead. I feel like, you know, when the snow of engagement is very Okay, she says she feels like, in a way, we're still engaging intimately, and it would have an effect even though you're not having intercourse. Very good. The way God created us, this is actually foreplay. The way God created us, foreplay is supposed to lead to sex, all right? If you keep stopping at foreplay, when you finally can have sex, your body's so used to stopping there, what do you think will happen when you can have sex? You're conditioning. You know, psychologists talking about conditioning. You remember the Pavlov dogs and everything? If you keep doing that and stopping there, your body's used to it, and so when it comes sex time, your body will be like, what are you doing? We don't usually go after this. <laughs> Seriously. And so for men, they may have problems, thank you, honey. For men, they may have problems, you know, moving forward. And for women, they may have problems moving forward. So this petting, I'm telling you from experience, ask God to give you victory over it. It will mess you up if you plan to be married. It really will. And if you don't, it still 
Whenever we go against how we're created, it can still mess with us mentally. I've had women want to commit suicide, and I ask them, when they break up with a boyfriend, I ask them, did y'all engage in sex? Oh, no, we didn't engage in sex. Did y'all engage in petting? And the head goes down. Because even though you're not actually having sex, the petting still creates a bond between the two, and you're so intimate with that person that you end up, when they break up with you, it's like a piece of you is gone. And that's why I encourage women, do not let men or do not engage in men going that far because it messes with your mind mentally as well, all right? And then the final one that we always hear about is sex outside of marriage. Sex is wrong. Do you know the studies show that the more people have sex outside of marriage, when they finally get married, the more marital problems they have, plain and simple. There's more and more studies showing that. Of course, you're not going to hear that because society says, you know, try them out before you marry them to make sure everything works out okay. <laughs> but you're not going to hear the stories where they're saying, try them out, and then you have a poorer marriage, all right? And again, as I talked about with the petting, the more you have sex, the more you're giving away a piece of yourself. And when you finally find the one that God has given to you, you, you don't have much to give to them. All these things have to do with purity, and this is becoming more of a problem in our church. So what I want you to do to get your participation, if you don't mind, in your roles or whoever you want to talk with, I want you to come up with a, a few reasons as to why you think petting, masturbation, pornography, sex outside of marriage is increasing amongst us as Seventh-day Adventist young people. I'm getting you to talk. You're probably looking at each other like, I'm not going to talk to this person. Find someone that you're comfortable with. Tell me why you think impurity is becoming more and more of a problem among Seventh-day Adventist young people. I'll give you a few minutes, and then I'll stop you. You could get it from my purse. Get it. Okay. I have one in my purse. Thank you. Show some text first, slides first. Thank you. Thank you. You're a thinker. Okay, I'll give you two more minutes. 
And then I'm going to ask you to designate someone, if you want to, I'm not going to force anyone, to come share some of what you um, discussed about why you think it's a problem. Okay, we need to be wrapping up. <laughs> All right, let me hear what you bright minds came up with. Who would like to come up and share what their group talked about in terms of some of the reasons impurity is increasing among us? As All right, brave volunteer, thank you. You could use that mic right there. I think they're taping. Oh, I don't mean to scare you more, but go ahead. <laughs> Oh, tape it, okay. No, um, we just said that um, the, there's a lot of problems because if, there's, if everyone's doing it, there's not many people to help each other, so you can't say to someone, don't do it if you're doing it yourself, so essentially the blind can't lead the blind. Um, also, we have a lot of friends that are outside of church, so like school, university, um, and you kind of want to do what they're doing, so people kind of fall into that trap, especially when they're doing it with multiple people, and mm. they're able to compare, so you might feel like if you marry somebody, you only ever have sex with one person, you can't compare, you don't know mm. if it's quote-unquote good. Very good, so it's because other people are doing it, and people are having multiple partners, and you don't know how much you measure up. Very good. Anybody else come up with some other things as to why? Yes. A brave male and then a female. I'm sorry, he was coming. Yeah, and then, yeah. Have a seat here. You can sit and then come after. Um, another thing we said is because it's not talked about openly enough in the church. Ah. So that causes a problem where um, people kind of think it's probably that they're going through things alone, where yes. it's a wider problem. Yes. As well as that, like, when it is talked about, sometimes it's not on a very honest like kind yes. of plane. Some people try to cover up their like or just hide it and stuff like that. Um, and another thing, peer pressure that we said, because yes. um, like influences outside of uh, your friendship circles or something like that, they might influence you and yeah. Very good, it's not talked about it. People feel like they're alone and if it's talked about, it's not honest and then peer pressure. Very good, my sister, come up. You know, I agree with what this man's saying. I think it's not openly talked about because there's a lot of things people just, oh, is the mic okay? Okay, thank you. So like I said, I think it's peer pressure when, when some of your friends who are not Adventist press, you okay, do this, do that. And you know in your heart when you say, no, I don't want to do that. Yes. It's, it's kind of a, it's kind of, if you get where I'm coming I from. I do, yes. It's kind of a struggle to like try and remember what God tells you and remember what to do was right. Yes. So I think if all these young people, if we like stand stand up, you know, firmly and stop being afraid of who you are as an Adventist, you know what I mean? Don't be afraid to show who you, you know, to be an Adventist. Yes. Just be proud of it. Like, don't be afraid. All right. We can sit down and end. Amen. No, I'm just teasing. That was very good. Go ahead. Oh, you see, like, Broski said over there, yeah, like, obviously the church is talking about it, but what what's happening is like they really like if they're talking about things like this, they they're telling you what's wrong about it, and like 
pointing it out and like making you feel like you kind of like the worst oh, sinner. Yeah, you're the worst sinner ever. Like, but they're not really enforcing the points where how they can be there for you and yes. help you go through the situation. Because it's not just like, like you said, it's not just the young people going through it as well. It's also uh, older and, and more younger people going through like, problems like masturbation and like, you know, petting, like you said. So we should, the church should more like show you the way on how to fix it and how to fix yourself. Yes. Instead of just pointing it out there, mm. like, yeah, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, but then not really telling you, like, yo, this is the way forward, like, yes. if you get what I mean, so. Amen. I appreciate you all being so honest. Yes, sister, go ahead. Thank you. And I appreciate you all cooperating. I feel like another problem is that, oh, my God, the light's so bright. Another problem is that when it is talked about, it's talked about as something that should happen after marriage. So it's like these intimate sexual feelings that you're having, you shouldn't be having them mm. until you're married. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So when you have them before you're married, because puberty is a thing, it's like, what's going on? And then there's also the fact that in media, mm. in, on TV, in mm. adverts, when you're walking down the street, sex sells and sex is everywhere. So you yes. see it all the time. So when it stimulates feelings that you're told you shouldn't have unless you're married, it's like, what's going on and what do I do with myself? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank, oh, one more? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. So just to elaborate, um, because it's a taboo in church, when it is talked about in like education, it's um, it's a, because this contraception is free, so it's actually um, what am I trying to say? What was I saying? <laughs> It's free, so they make it look like it's okay. Plus, yeah. like, um, if you want to do it in, in secret, like, they, they let you do it in... Um, they, they maintain that confidentiality. That's it, thank you. So, like, outside of church, because it's a taboo already, like, outside of church, all these people that we see as educated, they make it look like it's all right, and it's actually um, advised for us to have contraception. Yes. Does that make sense? It very makes, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Society, society. So I'm hearing a lot of peer pressure, society. We as a church are not helping you all. We make you feel bad talking about it. So these are some, did I have, you're coming up to share too? Oh, one more. Okay, y'all really want to share. Go ahead. Well, I think um, our sister group, we came with three points. The first one was we don't have a clear support system in terms of yes. pornography, masturbation, petting. Yes. We have support system in terms of sexual immorality, mm -hmm. alcohol, mm -hmm. but these major ones, we don't have. Mm. The second point was us as the youths, we don't help ourselves in terms of what we do with our time. Most of the times we spend time watching these series and all these things, and these things are promoting the pettiness, the sex, the masturbation, the pornography, and yet we spend more time watching these TV shows more than reading the Bible. The third part is, in the church, we judge each other too yes. much. So if I come up openly saying I'm addicted to this, we start judging, oh, you know, yeah, that's the masturbator or whatever, yeah. giving names and, and kind of that. So in the end, in the end, it makes it more difficult yes. for the youth to come up and say, I have this problem. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the major, Amen. those are the major three Amen. Yeah. Amen. Y'all are really making me think. I mean, the support needs to be there. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. We're going to talk a little bit more. I'm not, in this short time, I can't give you all the answers, but I can share a little bit of what I've seen to help people. Um, I like this right here. Lust is manifested in each of our lives in a different way. It's on the screen. Should you feel proud that you never looked at internet porn while your eyes soak up sensual images on TV? Should you feel smug that you don't masturbate while you keep going further and further in your physical relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Is God impressed that you only watch PG-rated movies if your thought life is X-rated? And I thought this was good to put up because we can judge, my brother just said, we can judge the masturbator or the pornography person, but we're looking at, we have an X-rated ideas and thoughts ourselves, or we're watching movies and things that we should not watch, okay? Um, and so, and then we, uh, us women, we have a problem with fantasizing. Men do too, but we have a problem with romantic fantasizing, which, which can also lead to lusting. And so we, we need to ask 
God for help over that. But I'm going to do something now that I hope you still like me, ladies, after I do this. But I think we need to be our brother's keepers. And um, my husband's going to come up and talk to you men because sometimes we bash the ladies and we don't talk about the men. So I'm going to play a little clip for you. Some of you have may have seen it. Just something for you to think about in terms of helping our men with their purity. All right? So please love me after you see this, okay? Promise me you will. <laughs> Let's see if we could get this to play. All right. See, Satan, you don't want me to play this. Honey, can you come up and see if you could get me to help this to play? It's a video. And of course, it's not going to play. Just bear with me as we see it always plays and this time I can't get the uh, play button to come up. Oh man, of all times. Ah. Is it doing something? Yes. Here we go. This, the beginning music, please bear with me, but where's the volume? Oh. You need that? If not, I'll just put the mic next to it. I'll have that. I'll take that. It's playing. We just play it and I hold the mic to it. Yeah, we have to do the, uh, we have to hold the mic to it. I'm sorry, you all. I, I, please bear with us. Time is running out. Is it playing? Was it loud enough here? Excuse the music. I wanted you not only to hear my heart, hear this exhortation, most importantly, hear from Holy Scripture. I wanted you to hear from some men in the church. Different guys were students. And so they would take a section to describe what it was like to be on campus every day prior to trans transitioning to what it was like to be in church. One writes, each and every day on campus is a battle. Listen carefully, ladies. This is not an aberration. This is not an unusual testimony. This is the norm. Each and every day on campus is a battle, a battle against my sin, a battle against temptation, a battle against my depraved mind. Every morning, Every morning, I have to cry out for mercy, strength, and a renewed conviction to flee youthful lusts. The Spirit is faithful to bring me the renewal I need to prepare me to do war 
against my sin, yet the temptation still exists. I'm thankful God has created me to be attracted to women. However, campus is a loaded minefield. There are girls everywhere, and it's guaranteed that I will pass some attractive girls as I walk in between classes. I either have to be actively engaging my mind and my spirit to praying, quoting scripture, listening to worship music, or simply looking at the sidewalk to make it through unscathed. Many days it takes all four to be safe. The thing that women do not seem to fully grasp is that the temptation towards lust does not stop for us as men. It is continual. It is aggressive. It does all it can to lead men down to death. And they have a choice to help or deter its goal consider this message my appeal on behalf of the men for you to help us deter the goal of lust in our lives. Sometimes when I see a girl provocatively dressed, I'll say to myself, she probably doesn't even Sometimes, when I see a girl provocatively dressed, I'll say to myself, she probably doesn't even know that a hundred and one guys are going to devour her in their minds today. But then again, maybe she does. To be honest, I don't know the truth. The truth of why she chooses to dress the way she does, the way she chooses to walk, the way she chooses to act, I don't know. Because I've never sat down with a girl and asked her all I need to know is that the way she presents herself to the world is bait for my sinful mind to latch onto, and I need to avoid it at all costs. He continues, For the most part, the church serves as a sanctuary from the continual barrage of temptation towards sin. However, the church's members are not free from sin yet, and there are girls both ignorant and knowledgeable of men's sinful tendencies. I must confess that even church can have several minds scattered about. And to the girls who are ignorant, please serve your brother and have your dad screen your wardrobe. Ask him how you can better choose holiness over worldliness. He's a guy, and he knows more than you do on the issue. And to the girls who don't follow the pattern of the world, thank you a million times over. You are following scripture's commands and helping your brothers in the process. Now the gentleman writes, having said all that, if I could say anything to the women in the church, it would be this. First, there's not a man I know that doesn't struggle in some way with lust. If they had any idea what went through guys' minds, it would probably vastly change the way they dress. Secondly, and I think most importantly, God has created his church to be a resting place for Christians, to be a place where people encounter God without all the distractions. It is disappointing when I walk into the church or an event with the church and have to deal with the same temptations that I face in the world. But I rejoice whenever I see a girl or woman that is attempting to serve the Lord in guise by dressing modestly. You have no idea how sweet and challenging it is when I see a woman who has decided not to flaunt her body like the culture shouts for her to do, but rather she has decided that serving the Lord and her brothers is more important. Glory to God for women like that. And let us be a church with men who are committed to purity and women who are committed to modesty. One more voice I want you to hear. At church... The one place where I might think not to have to face temptation is a church, but this is not always the case. 
When ladies that I'm friends with dress immodestly, it definitely has a negative effect on our friendship. When she dresses immodestly, it doesn't make it easy to see her as a sister in Christ. There is a constant battle going on as I'm talking with her. Communication becomes more difficult because as I'm trying to listen to her, I am also trying to fight temptation. I also think some ladies just aren't aware that even little things can distract guys a lot. Showing even a little part of their stomach. I am so grateful, he writes, for the friendships that God has given me over the past year and a half and for the godly ladies in my care group. I am so appreciative of the sacrifice that these ladies make to glorify God and to serve and care for the guys. I heard a story of one of the ladies in our ministry who went shopping and really liked a shirt she was trying on, but then she thought, no, I can't do this to the guys. That was the first time I had ever heard of anything like that, and it made me so grateful. It is such a blessing to have friends who care for me enough to be selfless and sacrifice what might look attractive in order to help me and other guys with sexual lust. I think modesty is so attractive and helpful in friendship because it makes it easier for a friendship to be centered around God and for fellowship to be unhindered. See, ladies, you're to be distinctly different. And non-Christians are to come here, and not only are they not to be distracted by observing skin that should not be on display, but they are to be undistracted as they realize this place is populated. who are saved, for the lost yet to be saved, and ultimately for the Savior who saved us. It's about the gospel. Now, here's the good news as well. The gospel provides forgiveness. So for all who have been convicted through this message, I just want to, at this moment, lead you to the foot of the cross so that you might survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died for the very sins that he has been bringing to your attention during this message, so that you might receive forgiveness, so that you might change by grace and for his glory. Let's not wait a moment longer. Would you bow your head in prayer? Good morning. I am the husband of that wonderful lady right there. And I want to just take a few minutes to talk to the men. Because many times we can look at the ladies. But men, I appreciate what I heard in that film. As the, the men were going from class, can you recount some of the things that they were doing in order to make it? unscathed recite scripture okay good I heard that from a woman praise the Lord what's that look at the, the pavement all right what else praying singing hymns and truly we have to do all of those things now there there are going to be as the, as the man said there's going to be loaded minefields all around Women that are looking great, women that are looking really good, very enticing. And listen, we, we're not to blame anyone. You remember in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve sinned, God came to them in the, in, in the garden looking for them. And they were hiding, they were cowering down. They were ashamed now, they were naked because they had sinned. They had, separation, they had been separated from God. And God asked them, where are you, where are you Adam? And he said, I hid myself because I was afraid. And he asked him, have you done what I told you not to do? And what did he say? He said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, 
she gave me of the fruit and I did eat. Men, it's time for us to be men again. Young men, it's time to grow up to be men. And let's not blame anyone. God is going to hold us accountable. So we, if we have to pray with all earnestness, then we have to do that. We have to sing hymns or whatever. And you know, I appreciate some of the comments that I was hearing, but the thing that we have to look at as God's children, and by the way, if you have not accounted yourself as one of God's children yet, then why we welcome you here. And may your time here, maybe the Lord touch your heart. But those of you that know that there is a living God and you have counted yourself as one of God's children, it, it does no good to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Because people outside of the world, excuse me, out in the world, would say, well, why would I want to come in there? We weaken God's church, so we don't want to be all the way in the world. We, we either want to make one choice or another, but we want to be all the way in God's truth. In John 17, Jesus' prayer to his, to his Father for his saints, for his disciples, he says, I pray, praying to his Father, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So God knew men that we would be surrounded by all of these images, women that are looking good, women that are showing their stomachs that look so nice, women with, well, we don't, we don't need to put those images in our, in our minds. And, and let me say this. I stand here not as one that's perfect, but one that has done all that you should not do. Well, not all. but enough of things that you should not do. I want to account, the time is running down real quickly, but I want to account just a, a, a quick testimony right here, men, of how I have been weak. Before I was married to this wonderful woman, many, many, many years ago, I was engaged to, to someone else. And it was a, I, had, I, I, lived in the, I came from out of the world. I didn't grow, to, grow up in this wonderful truth. So I had done most, a lot of things wrong. So now I'm coming into this truth, and, I'm, and I've been to, through Eastern mysticism and New Age and all this, and I'm, as I find this truth, as the Lord leads me into this truth, I think, oh Lord, this is sweet, this is good. But now I see that as I'm coming in, I see some of God's children are looking at the direction I came from, and I don't understand it. And I want to warn them and say, no, don't even go in that direction. But I find a, a young lady and I think, wow, this is a wonderful, this is a wonderful relationship. So I went to visit this wonderful lady. She grew up in the church, in this marvelous truth. We were having a long distance relationship. So I went to visit her. We went with some family members to have dinner. They were meeting me for the first time. It was the first time really that we had come together. And I drove, she asked me to drive because she picked me up from the, uh, from the airport. I went to, I was driving her back home and I was to stay with her family for the weekend. And we were sitting outside in front of the house just talking for a few minutes. By now it was night. I was in the driver's seat and she was right here and we were just having wonderful conversation. And before I knew what had happened, it was in a fraction of a second she had sprung out of that seat and she had sat on my lap. And it took my breath away. And I thought, oh God, what do I do? Now, mind you, I'm from the world. I know what to do. But I left that behind. And I was surprised to find one of God's daughters doing this. And if I was strong, men, I would have cut it off just then. I would have said, no, this is not the woman for me. I would have said, please, would you get over there? I would have said some kind words. And then I would have went away that weekend knowing that this is not the woman that, I was, that, that God has planned for me. But that's not, what I did. that's not what I did. I allowed myself to be seduced and over and over again, for 
for more than a year into this relationship, even eventually moving to this location until finally it just disrupted into flames. Men, we have to be strong in the midst of temptation. And we have to be willing to call sin by its right name. That, and that doesn't mean being rude, but we need to stand up as men. And it would be hard for us to do that if we are feeding our minds, feeding our hearts on the wrong thing. If we're looking at media and all these different images now, as the sister said, we're going to see those images walking down the street. One um, ministry I, that talk deals a lot with this Men, they talk about bouncing the eyes. We see that woman in those nice tight jeans, and we just, we want to look at those beautiful flowers that God has created. <laughs> no, it may sound funny, but I'm serious. It may sound funny, and you know what? When I find myself doing this, then I find strength. And that's not the first time that I've had a, a woman to approach me in that way, and even more aggressively. Men, we're at a different place. And women are being as bold, I'm not saying women here, but women are being as bold, as aggressive as men, and we have to stand up. The Bible says, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I pray that you would feed your mind, feed your heart with scripture. We can look at men like David, who is the worst of example, and yet a great example. When he was on that rooftop looking at that woman bathing, he should have turned away immediately. He should have been at war. He should have been at duty. There are places that we should be, but we allow our minds, we allow our eyes to linger, and before you know it, we succumb. Let us be strong in the Lord. Wish we could say more, but our time is up, and I know my wife wants to share more. We need to pray and feed our minds with scripture, brothers and sisters. But I say especially to the brothers, for you are one day going to be the priests of the home. And God will hold us all, you men, accountable. Boy, we're about out of time, I think, right? How much time do we have? Two minutes. Oh, wow. And I'm going to, y'all are going to accuse me of doing what you said we do. We talk about the problem. We don't talk about what do we do now? Um, um, you can't cleanse yourself. You got to look to Jesus. That's what this basically is saying. There's no way that you can stop yourself from masturbating. There's no way you can stop yourself from engaging in pornography. There's no way to stop petting. You have to get the power from Jesus. And a lot of the people who have come here, I'm heard, I've heard different speakers you all have. I'm sure I've spent time about the importance of watching and praying. And I like this right here. We have to remember this as adults and with ourselves. We must fight fire with fire. The fire of lust pleasures must be fought with the fire of God's pleasures. If you're taking one thing out, you got to replace it with something else. Find something else you can do other than masturbate. Find something else you can do other than pornography. Because you remember in the Bible, when the spirit left, then seven more came. So ask God to say, when those times come, what can I replace this with, God? Bring this to my mind, and it might take time. If we try to fight the fire of lust with prohibitions and threats alone, even the terrible warnings of Jesus, we will fail. If I just get up here and say, y'all are going to hell, you're not going to have a good marriage, that's not going to be enough. We need to find some things that you can replace the pleasurable things with. The other thing I wanted to, to talk about is asking God to create in me a clean heart, learning to love him, the um, um, eating, I mean, um, reading the Bible. All of these things are good, but sometimes our lifestyle make us weaker. When I'm dealing with people with pornography, I take them off of any stimulating food. Because see, pornography is stimulating, and if you're eating something that's stimulating, it's just gonna increase your stimulating appetite. And I know we are Caribbeans, we love pepper, we love vinegar, we love all these things, but if you are dealing with a sexual addiction, you need to be off of all those stimulating foods. Just take them as you can, you know. Um, you really need to avoid that. You need to try to keep your, your brain healthy, even avoiding high-fat foods. This health message we talk about can help actually help deal with addictions. People have been helped with addictions by changing their whole lifestyle. Getting to bed by 10 o'clock. I'm talking, this is important for everybody, but if you're dealing with addictions, your brain needs to be healthy, and there are things that go on in your brain between 10 and 2 p.m. a.m., and if you're not getting that proper sleep, it's going to be hard to get off that addiction, whatever the case may be. One minute. And if you've engaged in this and you're trying to overcome, make sure, know that Jesus can, can cleanse you. It's not over. God is still working in the most holy place. 
asking for forgiveness and make a commitment in your mind right now. Lord, I want to get over this addiction. I'm going to change my lifestyle. I'm going to stop watching these shows. I'm going to learn, ask you to help me to keep my mind on heavenly things, even though that woman comes by scantily clad. And I'm putting all these texts up here, not covering your sins and about the love of God, monitor miniature uh, um, media exposure. And then I'm going to end with this. Oh, young people, let us so live that the blessed spirit of God within us will not be grieved. So we will not be led into grievous sin, nor tempt others to sin. And also, so we may not cause others to be event offended or to stumble and Christ's cause be hurt. That's my appeal to you. And know that being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will be perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? I'm sorry I had to rush through the things, but our time is up. The media, uh, th this was problematic. I hope there's something, if you're struggling with an addiction, there's at least one thing you took from here that can help you. And know that God will help you. And make a commitment to be, to be a support to each other. If, if, if you come to a, a, a person comes to you and say, I have this problem, pray with them. And be open with praying with one another about this. I'm going to just ask you, if you ha know that you're dealing with something and you want God to give you victory, I'm just going to ask you to be bold enough and stand right now. If you know you're dealing with some type of addiction, whether it be masturbation, oh, I shouldn't have named it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any type of things when it comes to lust. Oh, now y'all are not gonna stand up. Uh, it doesn't have to be masturbation or pornography. It, it can be anything, but you know you're dealing with something that you want God to help you to be more pure. I want you to be bold enough to stand. If anybody's not, that's, not, that's fine. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Ronnie, can you come up and do a quick prayer because we're out of time. Thank you for your boldness. God sees you, the angel sees you, and he will give you victory to overcome by his power. Father in heaven, we thank you so much because we know that you are a God of love and peace and that you can give us victory, Lord. So you see your precious children standing now, Lord, desiring to be blessed by you, to be strengthened by you, to be renewed by you. And Father, we pray that you would bind the enemy that leads us into all these temptations, Lord. Deliver us from evil, Father, and give us the victory in Jesus' name. Amen.